All right, so this video, I'm gonna cover the installation and an overview of what to expect and how to use the AEM X-Series boost gauge. This is gonna be in my 2019 Golf R. This gauge can read from negative 30 inches of mercury to 35 PSI. I'll explain that here in a little bit. And it can also go metric uh, from negative one to 2.5 bar. So this is part of a series of gauge installation videos. It's gonna be a little bit longer because I'm gonna cover the wiring of this gauge. And while I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and do the wiring for the AFR gauge, or in my case, it'll be the Lambda gauge, which I'll explain in that video. Uh, along with it because I'm installing them together. It makes sense to run the wiring together and I'll do the sensor install for the wideband monitor uh, in the next video. And I'll do some more driving video at the end of this. It has a single harness with two pigtails coming out of it. I'll talk about that in a second. It comes with a vacuum tube or a boost tube, some butt connectors, a rubber band, and a sensor, which I already installed the sensor in a previous video. It's sort of up to you to figure out how to connect the sensor to a boost source on your vehicle. So I covered that in great length in the previous video. I'll put a link in the comments. I'm also using gauge extenders from CJM, which helped me install it in the pods pretty easily. It's kind of a nice add-on. I did cover that in the last video and I showed this little trick with the rubber band, but once I dug into the AEM kit, I did find that they have a perfect rubber band it's thinner than a normal rubber band, so it actually works well for inserting it into the pod and holds it nicely. So I took out my fancy blue skinny rubber band and put on this black rubber band and it worked out great. So looking at the wiring harness, uh, because I'm not using any other outputs, I'm just gonna run the gauge solo. I don't really need anything other than the power and ground from the wiring harness, uh, other than the one that goes to the sensor, which I'm gonna leave alone. So the sensor one I'm going to ignore, but this other one has an additional brown and white wire that I'm not going to use. So you can deal with this in a couple ways. You can just tie everything up and, uh, and let it be there. You can cut it or you can do what I'm going to do, which is I'm just going to depin them and keep them whole. And then that way in the future, if I decide I do want them, I can just plug them in and use them. So it's up to you how you want to do. I'm just using a little pick tool to pry up the tabs on these and it allows you to pull out the pinned wire uh, and then you can just reinsert them in the future. And see all this wire here that I'm not going to have to figure out what to do with on the install. I'll throw it in the parts bin and uh, I'll have it for later if I need it. So now instead of two big fat chunks of wire, I have a big fat chunk of wire plus a small ground and power. Now, that takes me a little bit to the air fuel sensor install because I'm going to tie these two together at the power and ground source. So I'll cover this more in the next video for the specific AFR gauge, but I'm also gonna depend the heck out of that harness because I really only need two of all of these wires. It has a lot more outputs. Uh, so now I have the power and ground from each gauge that I'm gonna tie together. And I'm basically gonna wire it into a single pair that I can then just run down uh, into the fuse box location. So I'm using the butt connectors that come with the gauge and I'm basically tying the grounds together, connecting them, tying the power wires together to connect them and then tapping them into a single pair of power and ground. And that way I'm just dealing with a little bit of wiring up at the gauge pod area and I don't have to deal with an extra set of power and ground wires. And then I'm actually gonna sheath them with that original sheath. Even though it still has the diameter handle all of the extra wires, it can flatten up pretty easily so it won't take up much space. All right, so going back into the car, I already installed the gauge pod for this. I'm just gonna basically disassemble, take that out of the car so that I can run the wires now. That video I will also link in the video description. This is the CJM Industries dual gauge pod for a vent mount on the MQB platform. But as you can see here, I'm pulling up these wires and um, trying to keep the hole as small as possible on this. So I actually depend the plug 
uh, just so that I can pull through the bare wires and then repin it, uh, you know, replug it back in. So I'm doing a lot of work to keep that hole as tiny as possible. And so you're going to see me do a little extra work. The solution, if you don't want to have to do this, is make a bigger hole. But it's also a vent that this is coming through. So the less opportunity for vented air to escape, the better. So a tip when you deep pen, do what I do, take pictures of things. And that way you can make sure you pen them back properly. This is the wideband sensor harness for the AFR gauge. So uh, I'm deep pinning this one because it's a really easy, big automotive plug. And so it's very easy to pen and deep pen. And this will allow me to route this through the hole that I have in the air vent. All right, so I can pull that through just like that. And then uh, just repen it using the picture that I took to make sure I get everything back in the right order. If you're not comfortable with deep pinning and pinning plugs, it's actually really not that difficult once you start uh, doing it, but it does seem a little bit intimidating at first. Just try it though, you'll be surprised how easy it is. And you can see here, I have all the cables run in a very small hole, which uh, basically fits it precisely. So now I'm just plugging in the wires into the back of the gauge. The AFR has two plugs and the boost gauge has one. And then I'm just putting them where I want them, checking things out to make sure I like it. Yeah, good to go right there. All right, so the fuse that I'm using for this is, uh, is one that I found on the fuse box. It's just to the right of that uh, 15 amp fuse. It, this is a five amp fuse that I have already powering my ethanol sensor gauge. So I'm just gonna tap into that. So I'm gonna cut that and then splice in the wire feed coming from the gauge pod up top. And then now I'll have power from there. Now there was a five amp fuse in there. I'm gonna change it for a 7.5 amp fuse. The reason is the overall peak amperage of the gauges is probably gonna be around six amps, which is more than the five amp, but less than the 7.5 amp. All right, plug that in, and then that's where my power source is gonna be. That's a keyed power source. And then I'm gonna put a, a connector on the end of the ground wire, and it's going right here inside the dash area, which is where my other ground was. Make sure my cubby all goes back together. My ethanol gauge is in there, but I don't need to look at that very often, only after I fuel up. All right, and there we go, first power on. You can see they both powered on great, which is good. Uh, I don't have sensors installed, which is why you see the sensor warning on each of the gauges. Now for getting the wires into the engine compartment, I'm using this little spot here. This is a DSG transmission, so it's an automatic, essentially, so I don't have a clutch. I don't know if this little spot exists if you have a manual car. Uh, regardless, there is another spot just next to it, which I have other things run through. So uh, you're not out of luck if you do have, say, a clutch going in through there. I just pulled out this grommet, and then on the other side, the firewall side, was this other little cardboard insulation looking piece that I just pulled out, and it was uh, super easy to do. That other grommet uh, where my other gauge is going through right now is just right here next to it up in there so you may have to do that any excess wiring will tuck up nicely up into the foot well there so that'll be easily hidden and then i'm just going to pull it through i did remove the battery it makes it a lot easier you don't have to remove the battery but i recommend it if you want to just make the job easier now how you connect to a boost source is entirely up to you I'm using a Precision Raceworks boost tap that taps into the manifold. I did an entire video on this. I will say I am changing things up. I did direct mount the sensor to the boost tap, and I was informed that that would introduce too much vibration to this particular sensor that it will not last very long. So I'm changing things up and I'm remote mounting it. And instead of having it directly mounted, I'm gonna use the vacuum tube that came with the gauge kit and I'm fastening it to the bottom of the battery tray. They recommend that you zip tie the vacuum hose to all of the ports, but I have these clamps available that work well and I'll just use them. So yeah, a little double stick tape and a zip tie 
will get me a pretty solid connection. And once I start the car, I can definitely tell there is no vibration right there. Just even at idle, the, uh, the boost tap at the manifold vibrates like crazy. Um, so yeah, this is, this is a better solution. So as much as I wanted to do a direct mount to the boost tap, I am glad I changed it up to use the remote option with the vacuum cable. And just tidying up this vacuum hose, make sure it's out of the way of any moving parts. And then I am drilling a hole through the grommet that I pulled from the firewall, cutting a little slot, and that way I can I'll let the wires go through there. And you can see here what the finished product there is before I put up the the bottom of the footwell pieces and here's after the footwell has been put back together. Can't see any exposed wires, used a little bit of tape to hold down that foam. And yeah, that's good. This is just for the Cobb access port into the OBD11 port. Yeah, everything's nice and hidden, looks super clean, and I'm very happy about it. Here's a final look at the install of the sensor coming from the boost tap on the manifold runs underneath the intake uh, inlet, and then right there strapped on the side of the battery tray is that sensor. All right, so now that we have it all installed, I'll show you a little bit about the gauge. Uh, it does have the green bars that run around that show you more of an analog look. Uh, it can do negative 30 uh, inches of mercury for vacuum, and then at zero, it changes to PSI. So your PSI in the positives and vacuum in the negatives. Again, you can have this set for uh, metric for a minus one to a 2.5 bar and the gauge face can actually be flipped to show you the metric version. You'll show bar instead of inches of mercury and PSI. If you do decide to do that, you can hold down the warn button for three seconds and it will allow you to change it to SI, which would be the metric. So English is US and metric will be SI. So speaking of WARN, if you press the WARN button, the WARM threshold will be displayed and they'll flash uh, on the outer LEDs. And then you can use the Warner peak buttons to decrement or increment the threshold value that you want so that when it gets to a certain level, it will flash. Uh, and you can change it to Warn when it's less than a certain value or greater than a certain value. If you depress and hold both the warn and peak buttons together uh, until less or greater appears, then you can change it uh, back and forth. And then that way, you know, you can set it to your preference. And then there's also the peak button. If you press the peak button, it will show you the highest sensor reading. That peak value will also be retained between power cycles. And then while that value is being displayed, if you press and hold that peak button for three seconds, the clear button uh, will show and it will clear out that value and reset it. And it's important to note that we only installed a ground and a power wire, yet this gauge has the ability to dim when it's dark and brighten up when it's daylight. And it does that because it has its own built-in brightness sensor. So you can see here, actually the boost gauge that I have changes from bright to dim almost immediately. But you can see in the AFR gauge, when it switches to heat mode, you can see it dim down uh, as the sensor detects that it's dark. I like the fact that the gauge has built-in dimming without having to run any additional wires to another circuit in the car, which in the newer cars is a total pain in the butt. So that's really it. Uh, that's a look at the installation of the AEM X-Series boost gauge in my 2019 Golf R. If you have any questions, let me know. And here's some more driving footage just to show that gauge in use. And uh, oh, by the way, here's a little bit of bonus brake boosting footage. I was getting a little bit bored, so I decided to brake boost behind this car here. Uh, and you can see actually with the AFR gauge how I get off of the gas and then, uh, and then apply the brake and then back on the gas and then you'll see the boost will build pretty quickly and I'm not actually changing speed, which is kind of nice. For those of you that aren't familiar with brake boosting, that's a good way to build boost before you, you launch when you're already rolling. Anyway guys, that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you on the next one.